Hi everyone, it's Blake from ChessPathways.com, and this is episode one of my new series, Taking on the Titans. This is going to look at some tournament games I've played in my chess career against titled players, uh, international masters and grandmasters. So for this first game here, this was actually my first game ever against a titled player. We're going back to 2013 in the Cleveland Open. Uh, this was round two of the tournament. I had just recently become an expert. My, my rating was a little bit higher than uh, 2,000. And I had the white pieces here against Grandmaster Sergei Kudrin, uh, who was playing the black pieces. So the game began with the con variation of the Sicilian. Knight f3, e6, d4, pawn takes d4, knight takes d4, and pawn to a6 here. I played bishop d3 here. This is a system I've been playing for quite a long time now. I still play it today for the most part. I know knight c3 is another move here, but I like how after bishop d3 you have the option to play knight c3 in some lines. Or in some lines you're going to play pawn to c4, like in the hedgehog and just really uh, really bind the, the black center here. Kudrin played queen to c7, I castled, knight f6, and here I think I made a slight inaccuracy here. I played c4 right away. Uh, nowadays I play queen e2 in this position, which I think is a better move because it stops what happened in the game. White has an immediate kind of positional threat to play pawn to e5, which black doesn't really want to allow for the most part. So usually they're going to play d6 here or, uh, or address that some other way. And of course we can always come back and play c4 later, often even on the very next turn. Um, by the way, one of the points of this whole system is it's probably not very good for black to expand and play b5 like they do in some of the knight c3 lines, because there, there's no knight here for them to kick away, and white has this big lead in development that white often gets in the con, and uh, it's very easy to kind of undermine this and play a4 here. Um, white's getting a very big advantage in a lot of these lines where black tries to expand too early, because white's going to try to open the center, this gives a, a target for the, for the white pawn lever c3, and uh, white's just going to stand better in a lot of these lines. But instead, uh, I played c4 in the game instead of queen to e2, and after c4, this move knight to c6 is kind of annoying. Uh, I have to address this threat to my knight right away. I exchanged on c6 here, but after d takes c6, knight c3 e5, we get a structure that looks very different from a, from a normal Sicilian structure here. It's pretty unusual in the Sicilian. We get back to this, you know, kind of symmetrical pawn structure. Four pawns on the king side, three pawns on the queen side, and uh, white and black both having kind of their equal share here in the center. Black actually scores really well on this line, um, because I feel like it's easy for white to play kind of aimlessly here if white's not careful, and that's exactly what happened to me in the game. So I would say the first spot to improve here, and an improvement I learned from this game, and that I've, that's kind of stuck with me, is it's better to play queen e2 here and stop this line. Not that there's anything particularly wrong with it. After this, uh, after this position, after e5, white's certainly not worse here, but it's just not a very ambitious try as white to get a big advantage out of the opening. So after e5, I played h3. It's debatable whether this is entirely necessary, but I wanted to play bishop e3 without concerns of knight g4. Um, and I'm, I'm close enough to finishing my development that we can start thinking about wasting a little time in playing some of these moves. Bishop e6, bishop e3, knight to d7. Kudrin is uh, preparing to play bishop c5 and really get all his pieces into the game. Black really has no problems here at all. Rook to c1, putting that rook opposite that queen. Bishop c5, queen e2, castle. And now I play a3, kind of intending to expand on the queen side and play b4, which makes sense. That's kind of where I have a, you know, a slight space advantage on the queen side. It could make sense to expand there. Kudrin stops me and plays a5. And here I play rook f to d1. And white is developing all his pieces, but you start to get the feeling that I'm playing a little aimlessly here, just like I talked about the dangers of uh, just a few moves ago. I remember talking to a friend right after this game, and after rook f to d1, uh, Kudrin played a4 here. And we, we, we get this common, you know, one pawn fixing two kind of structure. Now it's going to be really hard for me to ever expand on the queen side. And uh, one of my friend's immediate recommendations after the game was, after a5, to play knight a4. Just stop this idea of pawn to a4. Um, it, is, it is a double-edged idea. It's not just always good because this pawn can be a target. And that's what I was kind of counting on in the game, that I could kind of reroute, maybe even bring the queen back to d1 and really go after this guy. And if black ever plays b5, you know, that's going to open my rook on this file after, after these pawns get exchanged. But it just turns out not to work out in white's favor here. I think it's better for white to stop this whole a4 thing where this one pawn is really fixing two and to play knight a4 here. And after knight a4, I think the game is still roughly balanced. White has failed to get a big advantage out of the opening, but both players are fine and it's just a game. Anyway, after a5, I played rook f to d1, Putin played a4. And here I made my first real mistake of the game, I think. I played bishop c2 here, beginning my plan of trying to surround this pawn. But what I really failed to appreciate here is just how annoying bishop takes c3 is going to be. So I had seen bishop takes c3, and I didn't think this was going to be a big problem. I thought, okay, I can take with the queen. 
I see that I'm giving up the c4 pawn, but if you take on c4, I just take on a4, and things are going to be roughly balanced. I thought I'm okay here. And indeed, after, after bishop takes c4, white can go ahead and grab the a4 pawn, and neither player really has too much to complain about here. I think the game is still fairly equal. But I only realized kind of in horror after, after bishop takes e3 that if I take back with the queen, black doesn't have to take on c4 right away. I saw that Kudrin had this move knight to b6 here, which really worried me. Uh, a great multi-purpose move. It attacks c4 again, it defends a4, and what does white do here? If I try to add extra defense to c4, well now he can take it safely and I'm not going to pick up the a4 pawn anymore because my bishop's not able to, uh, to be on that guy. If I push c5, I think black still wins a pawn. Black can play knight c4 anyway, and there's a fork of my queen in the b2 pawn. So this is really annoying. So after, after black took on e3, I realized, oh no, I don't think I can take with the queen. Because black doesn't have to play here right away. It's that little in-between move knight to b6. So instead, I decided to take with the f pawn. Um, and sometimes this is okay to double your pawns like this, getting a lot of control over the central squares. But it really is a weakness to have these isolated doubled pawns. And Kudrin really demonstrated that for the rest of the game very, very well. It's very impressive to see how he kind of built on this advantage and what he made of it. So he played knight to c5. Um, you know, already starting to put, to put pressure on a lot of these squares and defend the a4 pawn. And I'm never really going to be able to play b4 successfully because of Anfasan. So I play rook to d2, starting to double on this open file, but there's really nothing to do on this open file. It's really hard for white to find a plan here. And by the way, I forgot to mention one thing. Uh, going back here, uh, if bishop c2 is a mistake, what should white play instead? This move knight to d5 is something I found when I was analyzing this game back in 2013. Um, that's a pretty good idea, actually. It doesn't, it doesn't give white a huge advantage, but it's one of white's few kind of active plans in the position, the point being that if, if black takes this knight, um, white gets all kinds of compensation, and white's actually probably going to win a piece right back because this bishop's trapped. And even if that wasn't the case, the rook being lined up here might lead to some tactical ideas. So black probably shouldn't take that knight, so that would be one way to improve on, on a white's position and play more actively. Instead of playing bishop c2, knight d5 here is a better alternative. Anyway. F takes c3, knight c5, rook d2, queen to b6, and black just starts putting pressure on these weak pawns. Rook to b1, kind of an ugly move to have to play to defend that guy. Queen a6, adding to the pressure of c4, and really there's no way to defend it already. So I think I had the right idea here. I saw that positionally I'm kind of falling apart. Um, if, you know, I defend passively, black's just going to start picking up some pawns. And black's pieces are pretty far from the king's side, so I thought this might be a good time to start attacking the black king and kind of generate some play for myself. So I played queen to h5. So Kudrin could have taken this pawn right away, but then I'm picking up the e5 pawn, so he wanted to prevent that. He played f6. And now I played knight d5, really just seeking complications here. And I remember being pretty proud of myself in the game to find this idea when my position was kind of falling apart positionally to, to generate some play for myself. The point being that if black takes this pawn, I think black's actually going to be in trouble. Because after I take back with the pawn, not only do I undouble my pawns, but the bishop's under attack, and now h7 is under attack. And black really has no good way of dealing with this. So I found, I found that knight d5 idea a couple moves after it was good the first time. Uh, of course, black again does not have to take this knight. Black played bishop to f7, attacking my queen. But that allows me to play knight e7 and save that knight and bring it to a more active square now where I can help out in the attack on the king side. That was kind of the whole point of my idea. King h8 and queen h4. And queen a5. Black's being really patient, not taking this pawn right away, really improving his pieces. The queen is just better placed here on e5 to swing back and help in the defense if needed, gaining the tempo on the rook. And Kudrin just understands there's no real rush here to pick up this pawn. I really have no way in the long term to defend my c4 pawn against the threat of the bishop and possibly the queen adding to it. So rook to f2. I continue my plan to try to generate play over on the king side. Queen c7. And if black didn't play queen c7, I, I had this idea to play rook takes f6, of course, when black can't take because of the checkmate. But, of course, now, if I took on f6, oh, sorry, if I took on f6, uh, black doesn't have to recapture the rook, he can just take the knight. And now, black is, of course, winning. So after queen c7, I played knight to f5. <clears throat> and now, finally, after a lot of preparation, black's ready to win that pawn and plays bishop takes c4. So where do we stand now? Kudrin got this uh, positional advantage, he converted it into an extra pawn, and I still have two doubled pawns here. So positionally and materially, black's doing great. Really, white's only hope in this position is my activity on the king's side. So I do my best to make something of it, but he really does a good job of just calmly defending the attack and just converting the advantage. So let's see how he does that. 
Bishop d1, trying to bring my bishop around to the king's side. I have ideas to play bishop h5 and bishop g6, for example. Bishop to a2, rook a1, bishop e6. Kind of nice how he does that. He, he wanted to play bishop e6 all along, but he figures why not kick that rook away from the b1 square so that I can gain a temple on the b2 pawn later if I need to. Um, interesting idea. So rook a1 and bishop back to e6. Bishop h5. And here he played g5, which was a really annoying move. I was really thinking I was, you know, <laughs> starting to get something going. If I can play bishop g6 on my next turn, I'm starting to generate some threats over there. And that was one real lesson that really stuck with me after the game, is sometimes you don't have to be afraid to push your king your kingside pawns here, even when you've, when you've castled kingside and your opponent has a big attack. Sometimes it's the best way to defend. Playing g5 here really takes away a lot of key squares from my pieces in this attack, kicks the queen away from the h-file, allows the queen to kind of oversee the kingside, so that space over there is pretty valuable for black. So Kudrin wasn't blinded here by any preconceived notion of, you know, not pushing the pawns in front of your king. He was able to, you know, con concretely find what the best move here was. And after g5, it's actually really hard to continue my attack. So queen g4, rook a to d8, and h4, just desperately trying to open lines over there on the king's side. Rook g8, rook a to f1. All my pieces are over there in this attack, but it's, it's going to be really hard to break through. Queen d7, king to h1. I'm trying to remember all these years later why I played king h1, and I can't really think of a good reason now. Um, probably just frustration that nothing I'm doing over here is really going to work. I think black can just really take their time, organize the defense. I don't think white's breaking through over here. Anyway, queen to d3, um, attacking the e4 pawn. Queen f3 and queen takes e4. So that's the second pawn now, the black's won. I don't really think there's anything I can do to defend that pawn, because the knight's attacking it, the queen can easily come to attack it, and what do you do? The other pieces can't really reach that guy without you know, making significant concessions. Knight h6, and here again, totally unpanicked, rook g to f8. A lot of players would be, you know, super excited they get to trade queens here. They'd say, yes, white was having this big attack, I'm up two pawns, I get to go to an endgame. But queen takes f3 would actually be a mistake here, because after rook takes f3, the rook's attacked, and I'm going to uh, I'm gonna be able to pick up this f6 pawn and really start to justify a lot of my activity over there on the king's side. So black's in no rush here to trade queens. He knows that I'm not really threatening anything in particular, just play rook g to f8 and keep everything under control. You're up two pawns. There's no real attack, as long as black's careful. I took on g5. There is that pin, but it doesn't do anything because of queen h4, picking up the pawn with the queen. Knight back to f5. And now, finally, black can force the queens off the board in a much more favorable circumstance to him. And there was really no way to avoid this, I don't think. There's no real, uh, <laughs> no real way out for white. So knight f5. The queens come off. And black is now down, uh, or sorry, white is now down two pawns, and my, you know, my imaginary activity here is not going to amount to anything. King's g7, and my pieces have nothing to really, really do. g4, and now black just slowly infiltrates. Well, <laughs> not too slowly, actually. It took about two moves for me to resign. There's, there's really no counterplay here, and black's going to start picking up even more pawns. So, very good game there uh, by Kudrin, and some, some very important lessons to take away from that game. One is to really be on guard against calculating too narrowly when you're calculating and not taking into account all your opponent's possibilities. For example here, when I played bishop c2 and I thought, oh, okay, this is safe because if you try to take on e3, I can just go ahead and take and you'll take on c4 and I'll take on a4. And you, cal you calculate out this long line and you trust it, but you don't think more broadly than that on every, at every juncture there. You have to, you know, always keep in mind your opponent has more possibilities than just the one obvious move. And it wasn't until he took on e3 that I saw this knight b6 in between move idea, defending his pawn and attacking mine again, and threatening the knight c4 uh, fork here of my queen and my and my pawn, uh, that I realized how much trouble I was in, and that I really was forced to to wreck my pawn structure here. So whenever you find yourself going down this long narrow line of calculation, always stop and think. You know, should I be thinking broader than that? Does my opponent have more possibilities than just the one obvious move I'm thinking about in my head? So that's one lesson. And then just the rest of the game, the whole way he was methodical, he didn't panic in the face of my attack, he just slowly converted his, his uh, positional advantage into extra material by picking up one of my weak pawns, and just defended the attack. He wasn't blinded by any preconceived notions about, you know, having to, you know, <laughs> shelter in place here on the king's side. He was free to expand the pawns, let his queen help to defend, just neutralize any, thre any threat I created, and finally traded queens at really the most opportune moment for him to get to that completely winning endgame. So this was video number one of my Taking on the Titan series. I hope you all enjoy it. Uh, please feel free to give me any feedback you have. I know that a lot of the game analysis videos I've been making have been geared more towards players in the 1000 to 1800 range. 
and I have that Getting Started series for beginners, but I'm really trying to add some more advanced content to this site to make sure everyone's getting what they need. Um, so thank you very much. Any feedback you have for ChessPathways.com or the videos I make, please let me know. I will see you again soon. Thanks.